Hi, this is Catherine Narducci, and welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Catherine Narducci, welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? Um, I'm very good. Very good. Well, it's an absolute honor to have you on my show. You are, of course, a legendary actress. But before we get into all that, can you tell me what it was that you aspired to be when you were growing up? What I aspired to be? Yeah. An actress my whole life. From the day I came out of my mother's womb. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. Oh, yeah. From as far back as I can remember. I mean, that even when I went to school, I was like, Nope, I don't need any of this stuff. I'm going to be an actress. This means nothing to me, but that was dumb. <laughs> I should have never did that. But thank God it worked out. It really did. And so I'd love to start off talking about your first big movie, which was, of course, A Bronx Tale. Now, I know you've told this story before, but it's amazing to me that you went there auditioning your nine-year-old son and then ended up with a huge role in the movie yourself. Can you tell me how that came about? Yeah, well, I was, um, you know, at the beginning of my career, not I had no career at the beginning of trying to be an actor I was a closet case actor nobody knew I was doing it um and I had gone on this open call my family didn't know and I was going on open calls secretly right um and my family had no idea I had headshots stupid headshots made this was after the fact actually after I got a Bronx sale then I went got the headshots made had nothing at the, at the beginning um I took Remember the Polaroids? Yeah, of course, yeah. I wrote my name. I made my friend take a picture of me sitting on my kitchen table. And it was so funny because the bottom of my feet was so black. I was in my backyard and and that's the picture I was sending out with the bottom of my feet like black. And I had my name on the bottom of the Polaroid. That was my headshot. So anyway, um... Yeah, I, I, somebody at my job said, you know, Robert De Niro has an open call. You should take your son. Not knowing I was secretly an, an, an undercover closet case actress. So I was like, oh, an open call. You know, I can go meet Rob De Niro if I take my son, thinking I would meet him, not realizing how the process works. And you do not meet them until you get past the casting director. But um, I took my son for the role of Colosio. And while I was sitting there, they, he was the last little boy to go in and they came out and they put a sign up and it was time for uh, the moms, you know, and I didn't know the moms to meaning Robert De Niro's wife. So when my son came out, um, these, when he was back there auditioning, the women were coming in for the mother role of Rosina and I asked one of them, why are you here? And they said, you know, I'm here for the mother. When the casting director came out with my son, I said, can I go in for the mother? Because I look like them, walk like them and talk like them. So she's like, you know, the, the little boy was an open call, but the mother, you have to be in Screen Actors Guild. Are you an actress? And I was like, yeah, but I'm not. So she said, listen, if we don't find... Uh, the mother today, we're going to make it an open call tomorrow. And then you can come in. So she said, call us in the morning. I went home with my son. Next day, my phone, I, I got up, I was on my way to work. And I said, should I even bother? And I decided, yeah, I should. And I missed work again. That's two days in a row. And I called up and I said, hey, did you find the mother? And she said, no, you can come back. And I went back, put myself on tape. I'm making a long story, very longer. Um, (laughs) I put myself, they put me on tape. I auditioned and the rest is history. I got the call the next day. De Niro saw it, saw the tape, loved you. Will you come back? Of course I will. I went back and I went back and I went back and I went back a lot until I finally screen tested for the role. And then I got the role. That's amazing. And so you not only starred opposite Robert De Niro in the movie, but he was directing it as well. What was that experience like? Not only your first big film, but also you're acting alongside someone who's also the director and one of the biggest stars in the world. You know, I have to tell you, it was very... The audition when I got called back to read with him was the biggest... Like, I would think... I think even besides actually working on a set, which I never did before that, but 
that had the biggest impact to me because when I got that call back and I walked into the room and it was De Niro and Chaz and everybody in that room, it was a very surreal thing. It was almost like a, a magical feeling like something magic is happening and your dream is, is about to come true. And I beat out 2,500 girls, but I didn't know it at that moment that it was gonna happen, but I kind of knew and it felt like a feeling that I still have never felt ever again since. It was very magical. It was like my dream became a reality. And even though I didn't have the role yet, just making it into that room and being this far from De Niro and Chaz and reading and saying, this is very real right now. You can get this. That to me was the first step of feeling that unbelievable feeling, you know? It's incredible. And it's such a great movie too. And I rewatched it recently and it still really stands the test of time and it's an all time classic. Yeah, it's an old time classic. And then being on set was the other part that everybody said, well, do you feel intimidated? Do you feel, and I didn't at all because the weirdest thing is I spiritually, not egotistically felt like I belong there. Like this is where I belong. I never felt like I belonged anywhere until I was on the set working as an actor. It could have been anybody. It could have been Robert De Niro. It could have been Joe Schmo, a little independent film, but I was where I was supposed to be. So it was more of a spiritual thing, not, you know, egotistical, you know? So I didn't feel that because I felt like I was with um, people that have the same ideas and feelings and passions as I do. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're so good in the movie. And then, so you went to start in three episodes of Law and Order playing different characters. But my question to you is this, do you think the characters could in some way have been related because they looked pretty similar? On um, Law and Order? Yeah. God, I swear to you, the only one that really stands out to me is when I cut off the guy's dick. Ooh, could I say that? Sure. Oh, um, <laughs> when I cut off the, I played Lorena, Lorena Bobbitt, the woman who had cut off her husband's penis and I threw it out the window, but I don't remember the other roles that I played on. It was so long ago. My God. I, wow. Um, I really don't remember. Can't be, honestly, that's how I have to answer that question because I don't remember. Before The Sopranos, you also starred with James Gandolfini in a short film called A Whole New Day. Now, I've not had yeah. the, the chance to see that yet, but for anyone that hasn't, can you tell us what that was about and how you got involved with it? Yeah, um, it, it actually was during um, The Sopranos, the, the pilot. We hadn't right, gotten okay. even, we haven't, we didn't even at that point get picked up for the series yet. So I had known Jimmy for that short period of time. That's where I met him on set of the pilot of Sopranos. So um, his best friend did this film, uh, a short film. And we, I, we actually showed it. And I was so mad I couldn't make the screening. They had a tribute to Gandafini and they had the short in Piccadilly Square over there. Yeah. And I, I, I was working and I couldn't, couldn't make it. Um, well, the, the movie is about this guy, it's called A Whole New Day, about this guy who wakes up in an empty apartment. He blacked out the night before and he wakes up in an empty apartment and he thinks that his wife and his, his wife left him. He's an alcoholic. And he wakes up and he's like, fuck, she left. She finally did it. She left. She left right under my nose. And the whole movie is about him calling me back and forth. He thinks I'm at my sister's but I'm really in our apartment but because he blacked out. He's in the empty apartment next door the whole time. And that's the big reveal at the end. It's kind of like a dramedy, like a, yeah, it's a dramedy because there's some humor to it, but James was amazing. I'll send you the link when, you know. Be amazing. Thank you so much. I, I spent ages looking for it online and I couldn't find it. So if you have one, that'd be amazing. And hopefully they'll show it at festivals again and you'll get to come over and, See uh, person. My my dream, my my I, I have I hate the term bucket list, but I yeah. guess maybe my wish list is to come and work in London. I would love to work two places abroad and only two, really. 
London and Italy. Really, when I was in London, I felt like I was with a bunch of New Yorkers with English accents. They're exactly the same. Yeah. It's similar in that it's a melting pot and there's lots of creativity there and tons of stuff going on and it never sleeps and it's yeah. a good place to be. Yeah. And you're fast witted like New Yorkers too. Like you're, you're fast, you know. What time is it there? 12 minutes past nine at night. Oh, at night? Yeah. Wow. I'd say 99% of the people, I was thinking about this the other day, out of the last 20 people I interviewed, 18 of them are in the United States or Canada. Wow. I know. I just love the culture and the movies and the shows and stuff like that. I lived over there for a time. And I think my internal body clock is kind of on Pacific time. <laughs> I right. think, I'm, yeah, I'm very much a night person. It works out for you. Yeah, it really does. So what's the weather in, in London right now? Most of the time, it's not too bad. It's pretty, pretty much the same weather all year. So mm-hmm. here in the summer or winter, it's kind of cold. It's kind of rainy. We get a few days of hotness, but mostly not so much. Right. I was so excited today. I got these. I don't know if you saw Euphoria, but I got these earrings. I'm going to show you in the mail. My character on Euphoria wore this blue sort of like suit. And the back of the suit said uh, God's word, God's will. And then I had this gun because I shoot this guy's kneecaps off. And these earrings are friggin' awesome. She handmade them. Oh my God, I'm in love with them. And they came today and I just so happened to be wearing this blue jumpsuit. I normally do these things chronologically, but I'm going to skip ahead to that episode because you were not only amazing and I think that that character should have your own prequel series. I'd love to see you exploring that character more. You know what? From your lips to God's ears, I, I can't even tell you how many times I've heard that. And that's what I love about this role so much is that no matter all the things that I have done, I've never had the reaction like this. And, and the, fun, the fun part to me is, I mean, you know, I love, I love young people. I love, did you hear that? I did, what was that? that that's some guy, nut job running past my window. Um, I love this role because I just feel like it really, it really just speaks to that younger crowd and I love them. And they're so generous and sweet and they're DMing me and making these videos of me, of the character. And it really resonated with them. And I'm really shocked by it. Like I did not expect this world win. And it really showed me something. It's like, you can do a movie and you could go around and you could do the press junkets and you can do, you know, red carpets and you can do whatever you want. You cannot force feed people what you, what you want them to feel about your characters or try to win fans over. It really is something that takes a life of its own it's a force and it goes on its own and you don't have to do a thing. You already did it. You did your job as the actor and the fans take it and they tell you. And that's why I love fans. They're like, oh my God, this is so cool. You're talking to us on Euphoria on Instagram. I was answering some of the fans. Uh, they were asking me questions of somewhere on Instagram. And they're like, oh my God, it's so cool that you talk to us. I'm like, like, it's crazy to even think like that because if it wasn't for you, we'd be talking to nobody, showing to nobody. It would just, you know what I mean? So yeah. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the fans and this girl who like felt the need to make these earrings because she felt so strongly about the character. And it was, I had so much fun doing this. And I think Sam Levin, are you caught up on the show? Yeah, of course, yeah. I think last night, to me, really, that episode pulled the whole show. It was an eye-opener for me. I mean, everybody sees differently, but it really pulled everything together. And this show, to me, last night said, it's really about, it's not about the sex and everything that he's showing. He's not trying to be clever and push. It's, it really is 
very much a realistic to me, it could all really happen. It does happen. And yeah, what I feel is it's really about how we're conditioned so young and how our childhood and everything that really affected us and has that imprint in our heart, how it stays with us the rest of our life and tells us who we are and how we react as adults with everything that has happened, traumas, good things that happened to us in our childhood, how it makes us who we are. And I thought last night's episode, when they were watching their life on screen and they got almost, it was almost like Scrooge when he goes back to his, 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 his past. Yeah. He said, oh my God, why did I act like that? I'm so sorry. They got to see their lives on screen and they were sitting there and it's like, could you imagine if there was like a, a device that was made that they could take, you know, our memory from our brain and put our whole life in front of us? It would fucking kill us. It would be heartbreaking. Yeah. And I felt like last night, that's what Sam did for the characters he took them back and they got to see how they behave. That's why there's all these, you know, repercussions of their past that are happening now and who they are. I just felt like we, it made us question. That's why the writing's brilliant. I was questioning who I was last night watching that show and things that I did. It reminded me of things that I have done in my life, you know, yeah. and 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 why I react the way I do and why I have the reactions that I do and treat people how I do. It's all from my past. Yeah, everything you do or experience informs everything else. And we know this already. Here's the part is we know this already. We know we know that. But Sam showed it in a visual way, you know? And that's the thing about artists. They take the invisible and they make it visible. That's exactly right. And it was so masterfully crafted, that episode in the entire show. And if anyone hasn't seen it already, I highly recommend you go watch it, especially season two, episode one, which I'm hoping we get a prequel to or a movie or something like that, fingers crossed, right? And I would love that. I, I keep thinking, well, people get up, you hear people, oh, she was in a coma for 20 years and woke up. You know, when they don't pull the plug and they let you live, they yeah. feed you, with you. You know, and I'm in the house, they're taking care of me. So I am alive. And I just keep thinking, how cool would it be? I have my own storylines of how I come back, but like, you know, maybe Zendaya is sitting in the room again, like she did last season and she's just staring at me. And I just look at her and I open my eyes because. That's how you come out of a coma. There's no like, uh, you just you come out of it. Not, you know, you need rehab and all that shit, but I'm talking about you just wake up out of a coma. And I'm like, would it be cool if I, I came back and I'm like, bitch is back and, you know, start all over again. It would be nice to be in the future. And I, I think Zendaya, um, all the actresses, all of them are incredible um in awe of them and zendaya on um, this the, the the uh episode before last night's it was like a marathon an mm. actor's an actor's marathon that girl gave gave it her all i was exhausted watching it and i felt the pain she never let go of it she, she, it was like method acting. Like she never let go of, of the pain. And it was just, it's so brilliant. They're all so brilliant. I just think that they, first of all, Sam Levinson is going to be, he already is. Um, it's already in his cards. It's already in his future. First of all, he's going to be one of the biggest, I think, film directors. He needs to go on and do brilliant films. He's the next, you know, brilliant Brian De Palma, Scorsese, um, Quentin Tarantino. He is that guy. 
he's brilliant. His brain is brilliant. And I, I love being a part of it. And I, I would absolutely love to be a part of it again. And even if I was never a part of it again, I'm still so appreciative that I was even a, even a part of it. You know, I'm so, I'm so happy that I got to be a part of that. Two great HBO shows, The Sopranos and yeah. Euphoria. Like I, no, I'm no. blessed. You really are. And so speaking of The Sopranos, you, of course, play Charmaine Bouquet. And in anyone's top 10 list of greatest TV shows of all time, The Sopranos is always up there at the top or near the top every single time. Can you tell me, having worked on it, looking back, what are your favorite memories and experiences just being on the set, being part of that show, part of the stories? You know, I have to say, um, we don't all keep in touch, like all of us together, but a lot of us keep in touch separately or like if, you know, if there was ever something that came up, we would all come together again. I, I just think that we'll, I'll always have them as a family. Every one of them I love this. We all got along so beautifully and I haven't experienced that yet ever again. Um, it was incredible. It was an incredible time. And to be part of something from day one, from the pilot, which I was blessed again, um, and to have worked with David Chase and Gandolfini and, and all of them, you know, Drea DiMatteo and Michael Imperioli, Vinny Pesto, all of them, Jamie Lynn Sigler, Robert Isla. I mean, I feel so blessed that I was part of that and the experience of being around them as people and forming this, this family, this unit and getting to tell a story with all of them. Another magical moment in my career, like in that I feel very blessed. I feel so blessed. And to be in New York doing the greatest show that was going on at that time, it was like that show, that was the show, you know? Just amazing experience. It really was. It was huge at the time. And even now people are still talking about it, which is amazing. It's, ama it's amazing. It's amazing. Seriously. Um, is, is it true that James Gandolfini gave the entire cast a gold watch after production wrapped? Yeah. He gave, wow. all, he gave all the cast members um, different watches, not all the same, like who got gold, who got white gold, who got platinum, who got stainless steel, some of the people... Um, he gave us all beautiful watches at the end, you know, and what a loss that was, I'll tell you. Really was. I, I'll tell you, every time I think of him or we start talking about him, it really hits like hard. That was a big, big loss. Hmm. You know? Not only to the cast and his family, but to the fans. I mean, to the world, you know, he was one of the great, great ones as an actor and a person. Yeah, he really was. And he had an incredible body of work. And, you know, he, even you personally spent so much time working with him and being around him and part of the same world. That's it hard. And I think when you lose people like that, that are so important in your life, the pain of that doesn't go away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It leaves a hole in your heart. Mm really does. Did you see, there was recently a Sopranos prequel. Did you see that movie? I hate to say I have not seen it yet. I hate to say that. I will see it. I just haven't seen it yet. I don't know why I haven't seen it yet, but I want to see it. Um, and I will see it. That's all I can say. I will see it. So you starred as Frankie Valley's mom in the Jersey Boys. Is it true that Clint Eastwood doesn't say action or cut when filming the scene and just lets the actors keep going yes, for as much have, materials inside them? Yeah, it's like um, I've said this before, but it is like a very, uh, a very, um, it's like a very calm uh, Zen set that he mm -hmm. runs, and and it's good because it makes the actors feel very calm and it's not chaotic 
they know exactly what they're going to do every day. And he doesn't call, he doesn't call action. He doesn't call cut. And he just looks like from there behind the camera and you know, when you're ready, whenever you're ready. Um, and then when, you know, you're done with your lines, it, a lot of times I just kept going. You just keep improvising, waiting for him to say cut. And I learned the hard way. I mean, one day we just went and went and went until I stopped. I was like, I don't have any more in me to keep improvising. It went on for a long time, but yeah. I love that too. Just when actors are given the opportunity to explore the scene in any way that they want to or express the character in different ways. Yeah. And see what works and what doesn't. Yeah. Um, it was, that was another blessing. I mean, I feel like I might, I, I fall under a very lucky star. Um, I'm a Sag, Sagittarius and a Scorpio on a cusp, November 22nd, but I don't follow any of that. I don't read my horoscope, but I do know they say Sagittarius is the luckiest sign. And I've, I, I always, I've always had, feel like I, 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 I always feel like I was very lucky in my career, you know, from day one. I mean, who gets to walk off the street and onto De Robert De Niro's lap? Right. You know, not being an actor, you know, and um, work with Clint Eastwood. I just feel like I'm, I'm very, I appreciate it all, you know? Mm. You know, I've honestly had the best time researching you and revisiting all the stuff you worked on because after that, now we're going over to The Irishman, one of the best casts of all time. You're on a road trip with Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, working with Martin Scorsese as well. When you, Instantly, when you were on that road trip, were you actually traveling anywhere or were you on a set or was it green screen? Or No, we, we had green screen for some, but we were um, actually... Yeah, we, no, actually we, we moved set. We didn't go really in the car. Um, at, we just moved the car a little bit. Like we were in the car for a little bit, but not, mm -hmm. of course, not that whole journey, but we would pick up, move, move to another location, move to another location, move to another location. And so we traveled in that way with, you know, on set, but not really in the car very far, but we did drive a little bit. Honestly, we did. And it was, that was amazing too. I mean, you're sitting in the car with Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro. You're sitting in that back seat and you're just like, you know, you spend a lot of time each day with them. And I remember, I always say to myself, every set that I'm on, you know, every set that I really want to be on, like that I, I wanted to be there and I manifested it. And I get there and I just say, you know, be in the moment and really appreciate it. Because when I did a Bronx tale and things that when I was younger, you're young, you, you appreciate it and you're glad you did it, but you don't really take it in. Like when you're young, you're like, next, this is great. Next, next. Now I'm just like, no, next. Right now I'm here. I'm going to cher cherish this moment and this opportunity and being around these people. And I was like that every minute on, on the Irishman. Every day I would just look, sit there and look at Marty and then look at Bob and look at Joe Pesci. And there was a day that we were all there, Ray Romano, Al Pacino, Harvey Keitel, you know, Bobby Cannavale, Anna Paquin. I mean, Stephen Graham, um, who I loved. Um, it's like, you're sitting there going, how the fuck did I get here? Like, how did this happen? Like, I feel very blessed, you know? I've had that conversation in my head quite a few times myself, you know? Sometimes you're surrounded by amazing people and it's really good just to soak up that moment and just appreciate it and make the most of it. Yeah. Well. Yeah. When you, when you, that's when, that's what the real gift to me is. That's mm -hmm. the moment that it's the real gift that you realize this is your life. It is happening now. There's no next. There's no yesterday. It's right now. If you appreciate that moment, it's such a gift to do, to be able to do that. You know, you just appreciate the big, the little, everything. It's your life happening. This is your life. Don't 
Stop waiting for the big events. Stop waiting for the big moments. Stop waiting just in every aspect. Stop waiting for the big house to have a party. Stop, stop waiting for it's now. Do, do, this is your life now. Your life doesn't start and 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 end in the big only the big moments. Mm. You know, it's every moment is your life right now. This is our life. Me and you, the world ends. Me and you are going to be the last people we see. You're not going to see your mother, your sister, your father. I won't see my kids. It's me and you. We we're ending together. Me and you. So one way it, to go. It makes it powerful. Mm that much more, even though that's an exaggerated example. I hope. <laughs> that's how far you have to go and then take it back because it really is your moment. Right now, this is our moment. The simple conversation yeah. is our moment. And we have to appreciate it. You're over there in London and I'm here in New York City. I'm loving every second of it. Having, having this moment. We are. And speaking of moments, so I had the opportunity to go to a press conference in 2011 and Martin Scorsese was there speaking about his new movie at the time, Hugo. And what really struck me was his energy and his enthusiasm and his passion for movies. He still has it. What was he like on set? Is it the same? Same, same. You know, I think I think that with Marty, it's the same thing. I have it, I'm not comparing myself to him, but that thing that makes you enthusiastic is his inner child is alive and kicking his yes, inner child, little 15 year old, 10 year old, 20 year old Marty is alive and kicking. And his spirit is still, that spirit still lives so much inside of him that you never lose the awe. You never lose your curiosity. You never lose the wonderment. You never lose still appreciating you're going to get up and direct a movie and be on a set and direct actors. You never lose that. Not a lot of people have that. That is such a gift. I still have it no matter what I do. Um, today, you know, I had a fan drive three hours to come down here with some stuff he wanted me to autograph. And I was just an I was in awe of him. I was like, you drove all the way here with this stuff for me to, like, it's amazing to me. It's just amazing to me. And, and it's, I'm still in awe of that. It's, I've done it a million times. I've been to signings. I've done it. I will never lose that spark. And I think that's what, that's what Marty has because I identified with it. Hmm. When I met him, I identified with that spark, that magic that you got to keep inside you, you know? So I think that really shines through in all of your performances as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Genuinely. And so one more question about the Irishman. So of course it's such an ambitious film that spans decades of time. And I don't think it was one that really could have been told before recently because Martin Scorsese makes the most of the de-aging technology and he makes people look older as well. Are you a fan of that? Do you like the idea that you, you could have a character play their entire lifespan now with the same actor? Yeah, why not? It's movies, it's fantasy. It's not real, it's not reality. So why should it be played like reality? We escape, right? We want stories. Sometimes we don't want like in life, even though we like natural performances and great storytelling. And, you know, like, you know, I said before in a euphoria, I was identifying with my own self, my own past. But there was a fan, there's such a fantasy world in euphoria also. And people question it. Like I saw, you know, you see comments and stuff and we're going to question it, but I think with somebody playing themselves, I it's a movie. It's not real life. Anything can happen, you know. So let yourself let yourself be totally involved in the story and be totally committed and go on the ride. Don't fight it. And if you just let yourself enjoy it and you go on the ride you you can enjoy it you know you can just enjoy it and and commit to it and say okay you know like peter pan you watch peter pan it's one of my favorite 
fairy tales. Like this boy who lives in Never Never Land and he's flying around with Tinkerbell. It's like, commit to it. That, that, that would, that's, it's real. And, and that right now it's real on the screen. It's a real world. So it's like, I don't know. You just got to have fun when you watch film and uh, stuff like that. So yeah, I think there's nothing wrong with somebody playing themselves through their whole life. As opposed to getting somebody to play the young you. Right. That can work too, though. Depends on what the director wants to do. I think it just gives filmmakers more options, which I think is a good thing, right? And that can either be executed brilliantly or really badly, but that's in the skills of the people doing yeah. it. Yeah. 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 I'm really excited to speak about this show as well. Olympia Gigante, Godfather of Harlem, one of my favorite shows now, genuinely. I've fallen. You get it there, you get it. Yeah. So I recently interviewed Vincent D'Onofrio and I managed to find it. And I just watched every single episode over the space of a week. And it's so much fun. I love it so much. The characters are amazing. You're amazing in it. What do you love about your character, first of all? I like her feistiness Mm. and. Um, I like the relationship, the, me and Vincent, I said to him, we're like the, um, where I decided we're, we're a dysfunctional family. And, you know, uh, the way I, you know, that one scene where I, I scream at him about his slippers and then the next minute you're just talking, that's like in life, that's real. That's like in life. Um, it's, a, it's like a real family, but I, I, I think we discovered that there's a sense of humor because I laugh in my scenes. I like laugh with him. And, and you know, like when he came in with the robe and the bag and uh, he, that was one of the first scenes that we shot. And I, I had never worked with him before. And I, I never, I don't think I've ever, I met him once a long time ago. And I was a little, he's the only person that I was ever in, a little intimidated by. I don't know why his presence, I, I, he's very strong, you know, he's a very strong presence, but Mm. I, I, I love him. I mean, that went away in like five seconds, but, um, I think our sense of humor, I think that's my favorite part. She has a sense of humor and she's funny, not trying to be, but she's funny. I think you have so many intense scenes because you're, you've got this family dynamic, which is developing such as stellar overdosing and things like that. But then you also caught up in real world events such as JFK being assassinated and things like that. But what is the, the atmosphere like on set when you're not filming? Unfortunately, it's very good. The, the, the first season was great because there was no um, pandemic going on. Of course, once yeah. The pandemic, once the pandemic um, happened... We had to be separated. You know, normally you sit around, you watch the other person's scene. If you're not in it, you stick around. Then you go to your room, you go by craft service. Everybody talks to one another. Honestly, with the pandemic, it was it was really different, really um, uh, a little lonely because you would go be done and you'd have to go right to your room and you couldn't really chit chat and, and, yeah. and form your relationships that you want to, like, it's good when you're talking to, if you're playing somebody's, you know, mother or wife, you know, you get that little familiarity going and then you go do your scene, but we couldn't really because of the pandemic. Otherwise, it's great. We all get along really well. I love Lucy, um, the girl who plays uh, Stella, um, Lucy Fry. Um, I love D'Onofrio. I love Forrest Whitaker. I don't have scenes with him. Um, Annabella did a guest appearance. Love her. Um, it's a good set. It really is a good set. And I mm-hmm. love Chris Brancato, the creator of the show. And um, the producers are great. Everybody's great. And we got picked up for a third season, so I'm happy. I'm so thrilled about that. And I can't yeah. wait for it after the, the cliffhangers of season two. And I've even been trying to avoid looking back at the characters to see what happened to them historically. Just to avoid, you know, so obviously there's some characters that I know what happened to them, but, you know, certain gang members or whoever, I'm just trying to avoid all of that so that I don't find out what happens, even if it variates slightly from, you know, real life. Right. Do you know when you're going to start filming season three? 
I think we start filming this summer, they said. Oh, really? I don't know, June, July, August, somewhere in the summer, which I'm very happy about. I know everybody else is happy about because we filmed both seasons in freezing cold. It was so cold, so uncomfortable. Um, there was one scene that I had to walk down the street into the club. I never go outside, but this is the one time. And I remember it felt like my feet were literally on the concrete floor and I had no shoes on. That's how cold it was going right through my shoes. Wow. Yeah. Where did you film the show? Well, Brooklyn, Manhattan, all around New York. Sure. Uh, on set in a studio. Our, our, our apartment, the Gigantes, our exterior is in... Um, it's all in Brooklyn, but our exterior is one is a real brownstone. The interior is a set. How much fun is it for you? Because the show is set before you're even born. Do you love doing period dramas like that? I love the clothes. I just feel like mm. I'm, I, I love, I, I have to tell you, I've done a lot of period pieces and I love the clothes and all that. But I have to say my favorite wardrobe um was euphoria really i love the blonde hair and the, they gave me this ring by the way the oh, amazing ring. and um i love the gold nails and i loved the blue suit and i love the leather suit i just love my wardrobe that is another reason i would love to go back get some cool wardrobe and the makeup the wings and oh my god they're incredible. I mean, the, the, the people behind the scenes are incredible. The DP, the makeup artists, hair, amazing. So you first worked with Chaz Parmentary in, of course, The Bronx Tale, and you haven't shared any scenes yet in Godfather of Harlem. Are you hoping to in season three? Do you know if you might be, or Forrest Whitaker, perhaps? You know, I have no idea, but I would love that. I actually said to Chris Boncato, the writer, I said, isn't there a way? Because I, Il Finesh and I, you know, she plays May May. Mm. I, I, we want to work together. We're like, can our worlds entwine somehow? It's very possible. Yeah. Um, we're all in, you know, Harlem. So um, West Harlem versus East Harlem. And I grew up in Harlem. So that's another reason why that show is very special to me. You know, I help them with location, some location. That, Fine look, but I, I took them all around Harlem and said, this is this, this is that. Like when they first, we didn't even start filming yet. I took them for a little East Harlem tour. Um, so I love, you know, my childhood uh, neighborhood. So I appreciate the show even for that aspect of it. I love the locations and the costumes and the set and everything. I've been listening to the music. Yeah. Yeah. I cannot wait for it to come back. Honestly, if you haven't seen Godfather of Harlem yet, everyone watching this, please go watch it. It's brilliant. And once you've watched that first episode, you'll be hooked. Yeah, I think so. It takes a minute and then you're hooked. Yeah. I'm very much hooked and I cannot wait for the rest of it. Can you tell me, by the way, how long does it typically take to film a season? Is it a couple of months? Is it like half a year? Yeah, it's, it's like six months. Mm -hmm. six months and then and then uh you know then going into you know editing and sound and all that before it even goes out I mean it takes like a year yeah so so we're looking at 2023 before we see season three likely I think so mm -hmm. I think so but I don't know I can't but I it seems logical like that would probably be a good yeah 2023 so I have time to watch it back a couple of times before. <laughs> so what's a, give me a good show. Okay. I'll tell you what, there's a show that I watched already, like seven episodes uh, called talking heads. I've not seen that. What's it's that on about? BBC and it's um, one person per episode hmm. and it's like a play, but it's a TV series in London. You've never heard of it? As you can tell, I'm mostly watching 1960s gangster shows from the US. You want nothing to do with it, right? You only <laughs> want to do it in New York. Just move here. I know, right? So if I come there, you can give me a tour. You can show me the good places. Oh, I could give you a tour, most definitely. Yeah. Do you know the good pubs? Because that's where I want to be. All of them. 
after the first one, it doesn't matter. They're all good. Just make oh. sure you start off in a good pub and then it doesn't really matter. But yeah, I know some good ones. Ah, oh. hey, we're going to have to do this. I would love to. I'd love to do a bar crawl in London. Honestly, you let me know when you're here. We'll make that happen. Oh, my um, God. I love it. I and next time it. I'm in New York, we're going to have to do the same thing. Oh, yeah. We'll close that shit down. We will. <laughs> What's your drink? Mostly cocktails at the moment, to be honest. And I've got really good at making them. Yeah? Yeah. What do you, what do you make really good? Old fashioned? I can do an old fashioned. And so the thing I was trying to do, the thing that impresses me is when bartenders make a cocktail blend from one color to another. So I was trying to perfect like a rainbow cocktail. So I'll put, there's a liqueur called Midori, which tastes like yeah. melon. And I just put a ton of stuff in it, aviation gin and get some. So I worked out to the different heavinesses of liquids. So orange juice is heavier than alcohol. So if you put ice in first and orange juice, and then you carefully pour the different colored alcohol on top of that, it settles on top and it doesn't mix too much and you can wow. blend it in. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you a photo afterwards. So wow. I managed to make an actual rainbow cocktail. Wow. Hmm. Do you have a favorite bar you go to? Most of the time, if I'm drinking in any capacity, it's at a press event. So it just depends on, you know, what they're serving me. And I love Leicester Square because there's so many, there's premieres there. I've done a lot of interviews in that area. Right. So, you know, I'll just go to any local bars and a lot of them have really nice views over Leicester Square or London as well. So I like Soho in London. I love Soho. Oh, I, if I could live in London, I'd live in Soho. I loved all the art galleries because, you know, I'm an artist. I'm in my art room, by the way. I love your art, incidentally. I've been checking it out on Instagram. Oh, thank you. Um, so, oh, today's Nina Simone's birthday. So I have this. I love that. Did you paint that? Yeah. I had the best time. I was there for the Ivar novello awards yeah music uh, my my best friend is diane warren she's a songwriter and she got the ivor novello award i was her guest oh my god i went then we got on the train we went to to paris <laughs> yes it's fun isn't it oh my god i was like what where are we? like in two hours we were in uh, it was amazing and i love the bars oh my god i had such a great time that's where I want to go. You got to take me around Soho and that, like around there. I'd like it. Yeah. So we, we can start off in Soho, go to Leicester Square, get on a train, go to Paris, visit Belgium, come back to London. <laughs> that's my, that's my next trip. Yeah. I'll start planning for that now. <laughs> yeah, please. So next I want to talk to you about the TV show Power. You played Frankie Lavaro in season one and you returned at the beginning of season two as well. Can you tell me, were you working on another show or a movie coming up at that time while you went in the rest of season two and beyond because your character gets transferred out? No. Yeah. I, you know, I don't, I honestly still till today, um, I don't know what the plan was. Um, it's, Honestly, it's sort it's sort of it was like a side swipe. I don't know what happened, but I I was it, it I was in shock. I didn't see that coming. But it's okay because I did, you know, right after that I got a really good job. You know, one thing, one door closes, another door opens, and it it did for me. I forgot what it was that I got. Um might have been, might have been right after that. I went to LA to film Jersey Boys. It might have been that. I think I forgot what it was, but it was a really good job. Um, but Power was cool, you know. I love Joe Sequora. Joe Sequora, the one who plays Tommy, is the best, and I, I still, you know, stay in touch with him. Um, I love him, and his wife was my makeup artist on The Irishman. Oh, really? Yeah, she's she's brilliant. She's a brilliant makeup artist. So um, it was it was fun. You know, um, Power was an intense show. It was very intense. Mm. Um, I never worked like that, like the speed of it and how they operate. It's it was different. Yeah, I've only seen up until the point where you left the show, so I don't know what happens after that. So I'm going to have to. I love you. You just right? became my best friend. 
No wonder we're dealing with this interview. Exactly. There's no reason to watch it if you're not in it because you, you, you're in the best shows and the best part of the show is the bit you're in and then we're done. Oh, thank you so much. It's true. There's a movie called Lost Cat Corona, which changed its name to a cat called Leonard. And it stars Ralph Macchio. There's a cat missing. But can you tell me, are you more of a cat or a dog person? I'm definitely a dog person. You know, I love cats when they belong to somebody else. Like I love if I go to your house and you have a cat, I'll love like love your cat. But I, I don't have an animal because I raised two kids and I don't need to be raising anything else or responsible for anything else in my life except myself. And, um, but if I, I was thinking, and I think a lot of people, don't you feel like a lot of people were thinking about if they didn't have an animal to own an animal during the pandemic, like they said, dog adoption was like, they couldn't through the roof. I like dogs. I watch a lot of animal. Um, like I, I go on YouTube and I watch, um, you know, I guess it would be um, what Animal Planet. Yep. I'll watch like you know, the Blue Bird of Paradise is fascinating creature. I'll watch you know, lions and gorillas. I like exotic. Well, I love watching like animals in the wild and all that. It's scary and fascinating. It really is. There's these undiscovered worlds and because technology is getting so good now, they can really get up close and you can see them, their natural habitat and see what they do underground or at night yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, it's I love crazy. all that. Yeah. It's crazy. So you also starred in another amazing movie, Bad Education with Hugh Jackman. It's based on a true story, but do you know if your character was a real person? You know, I don't know. Um, I think probably she was just one of the you know, somebody in the community when it was happening and with her kid and all that. But um, I I don't know. I had no, there was no backstory or anything like that. I did all the, made it all up on my own, you know. Um, but I'll tell you one thing that was in the moment I got to like be up and close and personal with you, Jackman, you know. Right. And uh, what a nice guy. Like all the room is a true, he is a gem. He gave everybody lottery tickets. And I heard he does that on every set. He comes with lottery tickets. He gave us all lottery tickets. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And he's so super sweet. And I loved working with him. Hmm. You know, he's another one. Wow. I mean, it's his inner child is like right here. Like it's on his chest. He's got all the energy. He does Broadway, sings, dances. You know, he's another one with curiosity and awe, still in awe of life. You know, his child, inner child and his spirit, child spirit is woo, off the charts. Really is. He's such an amazing talent. And I really regret I missed the opportunity to see a live stage show he was doing where he was doing hits from The Greatest Showman and stuff like that. But I'd oh, love wow. to see him do that. Wow. Me too. He's amazing. So down to earth. I love that. I always, I realize one thing, the bigger they are, the more humble they are. Hmm. It's, they have no insecurities. They don't have to prove anything. They're just, that's it. They're just themselves, you know, a lot of them anyway. I'm sure not everybody, but I, 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 I've come to uh, learn that, that the Clint Eastwoods and De Niro's, they're all just, you know, they, they have nothing to prove and they're, they're, they're just, you know, not assholes. Like mm. some of the up and coming ones that try to prove something. Yeah. I, I think sometimes it takes a long time to learn that rather than just trying to please everybody or just trying to be everyone else's version of what you should be, just be the best version of yourself. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's absolutely true. Now, you starred in some phenomenal gangster movies, but one that really took me by surprise was Capone. So it stars Tom Hardy, but it's a completely different perspective on a gangster film. You're seeing the final years of this person's life. Was that interesting for you to do and be a part of that? You know, I have to tell you, I didn't have like a big part in that. I played mm. his sister, but yeah. I was there for the whole time. Like they wanted us there and I was there and I was in that house a lot. And I, I was with Tom a lot, like another humble, unbelievable 
to me, that was my experience. Very humble, um, very nice guy. And I think he's so talented. And I wouldn't expect Tom Hardy to do the ordinary or basic. You know, that guy is anything but a basic bitch. <laughs> He's so out there and that's what makes him so great. Yeah. You know, it makes him great. And he's another one that's just so humble. Like we all love Tom, you know, he was mm-hmm. the best. I, I, I really, really, you know, enjoyed working with him. Definitely. And he's funny as fuck. Yeah. He's so funny. Oh my God. What a sense of humor. Can you tell me, did he stay in character? Because it seems like one of those roles. No, as soon as they would cut, he was out of character. Okay. Yeah, really good. Really fun. You know, we hung out after work um, a couple nights. You know, we went to his house one night. He and his wife invited everybody. Mm. And he went out, he shopped. And then he came back and he made us burgers. You know, but... Um, what's it called? Um, what is that burger that's not really meat? And he made us those, those. I don't think he eats meat if he made those burgers. And I don't eat meat, so it was great. And he made us burgers on the barbecue and so humble and down to earth. And his wife is so beautiful. Oh my God. You know, it's nice. Here's a question that I ask every guest on the Sarah O'Connell show. Can you tell me a fun fact about you, a hobby, a party trick, something like that? A fun fact about me? Um, I mean, not a lot of people know that I paint, even though I post it and stuff. But I mean, I think that's probably um, this room speaks for the fun fact. You know, this is my it's a big mess and I have to. Well, that's my Sopranos chair. They let us take them home. Um, you know, it's. I think it's. It's uh, probably that I'm an artist. You know, a lot of people don't know that, but you know, now with social media, and I just started posting a lot. Um, last year, I started posting my art a lot on on Instagram and posting and posting. So. It's starting people some, but, and I also, I have shows, you know, I sell my art galleries. Um, I've had a couple of art shows. So I posted that, you know, I'm showing you galleries, but people were shocked by that. They're like, I didn't know. And they still say it. I didn't know that you painted. How long have you been painting for? When did you get into that? Uh, like since 1993. Yeah. Um, 93, I started painting. Yeah. Have you got a favorite kind of thing to paint? Do you prefer people or landscapes or objects? You know, or? I feel like um, I paint a lot of female nudes. Hmm. Um, and I abstract, I, I do abstract and female nudes. But I do like my female nudes and sort of an abstract. They're kind of abstract. They're not, it's not realism. It's not like, you know, but they're kind of, you know, I don't know. Yeah, more more abstract um, and abstract figurative, I would say. Let's plug this now. So you, of course, you're on Twitter and Instagram as well. Can you tell everybody what that is so they can follow you? The little circles on your page, the stories that you put, the ones that remain on the bottom. All my, a lot of my art is in there at Catherine Arducci. That's it. It's just my name, K-A-T-H-R-I-N-E. There's no E before the R. Can you tell me what you're working on next? What have you got coming up in 2022 and beyond, perhaps, that you can talk about? Well, I just have, you know, Godfather Problem, season three, but I also have something that I'm producing with the comedian Colin Quinn. Yeah. And the actor Vincent um, uh, Piazza. He was in Boardwalk Empire. He played like yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, the three of us filmed something couple of months back that Colin wrote and it is something we're working on we're editing now we we filmed it me and Vincent are uh, the actors in it um but we we want to we're using it as content to pitch as a full series so that's something that we're working on right now for my own personal thing and um I'm also working on an animation that I wrote and I can't talk too much about that because I don't want to, I don't want to say anything because I'm still pitching it and taking meetings on it and trying to, you know, get it done. 
course, well, wishing you the very best of luck on both of those. And of course, you'll have to come back on my show when they're on TV or in movie yes. theaters to talk about them too, right? Yes, of course. And maybe I'll come back. Maybe you'll have your, I'll be sitting right next to you. I'll be in London. Oh yeah, we so we can film our interview and then we can go on a five day pub crawl to London and Paris oh, and Belgium and then back and see some art. I want to eat, see art, and get drunk. London's a pretty good place <laughs> to do that. Yes, but um, thank you so much. I mean, it's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute honor speaking to you. I've got a couple more questions, if that's okay. So sure. one of them is: Have you got any advice for anybody that wants to become an actor? For somebody who wants to be an actor. It- advice is that you know it's not a guaranteed profession it's not a guaranteed career it's a crapshoot and I suggest that of course you have your side job to keep you a roof over your head and your bills paid but if you're gonna do it only do it if that if you didn't do it, you would die. If you don't feel that way, then don't do it. You have to do it. Because to me, art, any form of art, it's another spiritual thing I talk about. But to me, it's a calling. And it is something that, you know, it's, it's a, to me, it's like a gift from God. It's like a gift that you have. Mm. And it's something that you, if you were meant to do when you were born with a gift, you know that organically, you can't force it. You can't force these things and you have to do it. You have to do it. And if you don't do it, you'll die. And if you don't feel that way, don't even start. Don't even start because then you won't be happy because no matter what, I was always happy in my struggles. And I still, still am happy when I feel like, God, I want to do more, or I can do more. I want to do this, or I want to do that. And even if I don't get that, things that I want in my head, certain things, I'm still happy. I don't feel, you know, bitter or um, like things are not fair. And I don't look at it that way. I knew the day that I, I signed up and committed to this, that that's what it would be. And that's the deal. And that's the contract of being an actor. You know, you've got to, you're either going to have long hardships and suffering and not work for long periods of time, or you're going to work all the time, or you're just going to take off and just, you know, like a Shia LaBeouf or, you know, uh, Timothy Chalamet, but you know, either you take off or it's struggling and that's what you got to accept, you know, and that's it. That's you either have to do it. You will die if you don't do it or just don't do it. And if you want to do it, then I suggest get in class, do, do put up scenes in class, hone in on your craft, uh, join a theater group, do plays off, 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 off Broadway. If you can't even get in that, then have readings in your apartment. Have a bunch of friends over, buy a play, work on a play in your house, workshop it at home. Try to find a place maybe you can put it up. Just, you know, things like that. That is phenomenal advice. Thank you. Add in your interviews, mm. call it the, Kathy, the Catherine Narducci question. And, and I ask everybody, it's the Catherine Narducci question is, uh, who would you take with you on a ball crawl? Okay, <laughs> okay I'm going to start doing that. Who would you take with you on? Who would be like the perfect match with you on a ball crawl? <laughs> and if you don't drink, I guess, who would be your perfect, uh, who would you like to have dinner with? I'm going to start by asking you your own question. Who would you go on a bar crawl with? I'm only thinking now bar crawl wise, not crush or anything. Like who would be a good bar crawl person? Quentin Tarantino or who's the actor that was in a, uh, He's Irish with the black hair, gorgeous. Oh, God, I'm forgetting his name. Colin Um, Farrell? Yes. Wow, I gave you nothing and you gave me the answer. I think he would be fun. I'm just thinking ball crawl. I'm going to have to start doing that. I'm going to have to start working this question into my interviews. I like the (laughs) idea of it. Well, how about, here's a great question. Who would you like to have one 
slow dance with. Oh, wow. No strings attached. Just one slow dance, call it a night. One full <laughs> beginning to end song. You know, just that's it. Real slow, old fashioned, slow, one on one fucking slow dance. So, of course, you need to tell me your answer for that as well. Just so that <laughs> I have it for reference. Uh, who would that be? Wow. I don't know. I mean, I'd say Leonardo DiCaprio. I'd say Leo. Just a slow dance. No, no, nothing. Just a, or maybe not. You know, maybe I like Leo. I don't want to renege, but it's just the dance. It's not the, these questions have to be very specific. You're not asking who, you, it's very, each thing could be like, who would you want to go for a bike ride with? Who would be a good this? But very specific people for different categories. You know, who do you, who would you want to go karaoke, karaoke with? Sure. So they're not a lifetime commitment. They're just literally one slow dance, one pub. In call. and out. Yeah. In and out. In and out. <laughs> who would you want to go on a shopping spree with? Like just things like that. You know, who would you have to have one good Manhattan with? Not a ball crawl, two different things. I'm going to have to start a second show now to get through all these yeah. questions. <laughs> <laughs> and so my final question, have you got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and your fans around the world? Messages for around the world. Whoa. Wow. Um, yes, I do. In the times that we are living in right now, I'm not, this is not preachy or anything. I think that we have to stop judging each other um, and what our beliefs are. And it's not me against you as a human species on this planet earth. We have to have and find empathy for each other and be more open-minded and listen to each other. You know, it's not your way or the highway. It's, it's just not that it's like, we all have voices. We all want to be heard and more listening, more empathy, more love, more kindness, more giving. Instead of, don't be a giver, be, don't be a taker, be a giver. That's very good advice. Well, Catherine Nardici, thank you so much for coming on my show today. I'm the biggest fan of yours and I really love chatting to you. Thank you. And thank you to everybody watching at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give this video a big thumbs up and leave lots of lovely comments. I'll see you all again soon for another episode of the Sarah O'Connell Show. Bye. Bye. It was nice talking to you.